We've come, brethren, sisters and young people, in this series on understanding the apocalypse to the historical section, or one of the historical sections, as they are now. They were prophetic when John received them. But from our perspective, they are historical sections of the apocalypse. And for that reason, we are going to go a little slower in our consideration of what is in front of us now. We're going to have three nights on chapter 6 and we shall point that out in a moment when we come to have a look at the content of chapter 6. I just want to step you back and to emphasise the importance of what we are now considering in the Apocalypse. Because as we read there in chapter 6 verse 1 it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were, it wasn't actually thunder, but as it were, the noise of thunder. That, of course, startled John and he realised that something now important was going to happen. What was happening was that he was being shown by this revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ of what was going to happen in history from his time onwards. Thank you, brethren. And so... We believe that what we are considering here in chapter 6 is from, is from John's time in AD 96 onwards. Now we get this clear impression from the very first verse of the Apocalypse, chapter 1 and verse 1, which says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So, the point we make about that is that when we do get into the area which has to do with the unfolding of history, that it has to be immediately after the time of John. Now we believe John was in the Isle of Patmos around about AD 96, in the last year of the reign of Domitian, a very vicious persecutor of the Ecclesia. And he was to die in that year by assassination. And we believe that is the, is the thunder or that which was like thunder. As we shall see in a moment, thunder has to do with political change and that brought about some very serious political change in the Roman Empire. In chapter 4 and at verse 1, we read this. After this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So when you put chapter 1 verse 1 alongside of chapter 4 verse 1, it's very clear, isn't it, that the things that John began to see in chapter 6 had to do with the immediate future from his day. And that's why we date the first seal from AD 96 the year of the death of the Emperor Domitian. Now, let's just take, first of all, the big picture view of not just the seals, but what flows out of the seals. And I think most of us are fairly familiar with this imagery now which you've been looking at while I've been talking. The telescopic view of the apocalypse, which Brother Roberts uses in his lecture on the subject in the 13 lectures on the Apocalypse. And this telescopic view, I think we, we have a bit of an appreciation of what this is about. You will see that there are six seals here because the seventh seal goes on to the end but it embraces the trumpets, the vials and the thunders. So the Apocalypse in its seals, trumpets, vials and thunders is like a telescope. You can sort of bring it down and you can take it out. And here we've got the extended view of it. So there are six seals followed by a seventh which, is, which incorporates seven trumpets. So you've got the six trumpets here and the seventh trumpet begins the vials. And there are six vials shown here and the seventh vial, the wrath of God, is unfolded in seven thunder judgments. Now the importance of those thunder judgments on the end over here is that that is a period of 40 years which is yet in front of us. 
We believe that the history has unfolded from AD 96, which you'll see in a moment, down to our own day, here in the sixth vial period. And what is before us now, very soon, is an intense period of divine judgment of 40 years where there will be seven thunders poured out upon the nations to establish the kingdom of God. When you look at this from a slightly different perspective, it uh, perhaps is helpful to see it in this way. It's not helpful me to have this tree in my way. Just get that out of the way. So we've got here the six seals beginning in AD 96. They go through to 324. The seventh seal is opened then. It continues on, of course, until the consummation, the millennium. But the seventh seal is unfolded now by seven trumpets. And here you have your trumpets beginning in, the, in this era, 324, through to 1789, which, of course, we know as the era of the French Revolution. And then the, the vials, which began with the French Revolution, have been unfolding or being poured out, to use the more literal terminology of the apocalypse, down to our day. And we know that we are in the sixth vial period, very close to the last event of the sixth vial, which is the gathering of the nations into a place called Armageddon. Armageddon is in fact a sixth vial event. Its outcome, which takes some 40 years to develop, is a seventh vial event. So the seven thunders have to do with the events from Armageddon onwards. And then you have, of course, the establishment of the kingdom. So you've got the unsealing of the seven sealed scroll. I'll leave it to Brother Peter Osmond to actually physically demonstrate that if he can find his scroll at home next time around. So I think most of us are fairly familiar with that, but it's very important to have that scheme of things clear in your minds. Now you have actually in, your, in the earlier part of your notes, you've got some stuff on that uh, which you can refer back to. Now the content of chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, which we've read, contains the first two seals. We'll deal with those tonight. Brother Peter Osmond is going to deal with the third and the fourth seal, the black horse and the pale horse, in the next session. And Brother Morris is going to deal with the fifth and sixth seal. Uh, I've said that because, uh, just to remind them, that it's coming up. And... Uh, they're not uh, going to be saddled with too much to, to deal with in one night. And th that's quite deliberate because we want to take it fairly slowly and we want, to, we want to make sure that the history comes across in sufficient detail to be clear and to be memorised to some degree. We don't want to go into too much complexity but we do want you to take something away permanently and that's why I would love you, if you haven't... Uh, been marking up thus far to count this as a new start because this is, as it were, a point in which we can make a new start in the apocalypse. We've looked at all of the previous chapters and the visions that have led us now to the historical part of the book. So it would be a good idea if you haven't uh, already got this marked up, and many of you will have, to make a start on it. So you've got something permanent that you can carry away uh, from this study. Now, as you can see there, the whole of the sixth chapter has to do with the unfolding of this seven-sealed scroll. The seventh seal comes a little later in chapter 8. And we're going to be considering just the first two. The first seal represents an arrowless bowman riding a horse. So here he is. You've got a white horse. You've got a bowman sitting upon that horse... <coughs> He's got a bow, but no arrow. We're going to try and explore what that represents, what the, what the horse represents, what the arrowless bowman represents. We believe the horse is just one of many symbols used in the apocalypse for the Roman Empire. And the rider of the horse we'll talk about in a moment. Now, the Roman Empire covered a vast tract of territory, at least for those days. <coughs> Here is a, uh, a perspective of the world looking from uh, Central Africa, north, embracing, uh, you can see uh, Britain on the left-hand side and 
over towards uh, uh, Persia or Parthia over here uh, on the right hand side. Now the Roman Empire embraced the territory that you can see inside that red line. So it was a vast empire by any standards. The peoples who lived to the north and to the east were barbarians without uh, any civility at all. Probably of course there were Chinese or whatever over in the, in the east that nobody knew anything about. There were certainly uh, people down here in Africa that nobody knew anything about. So this was basically most of the then known world and it was absorbed by the Roman Empire. When you look at that in a different way, this is just an ordinary map, you can see the extent of that empire and the provinces of it, extending right up here into Scotland. Hadrian's Wall was built up there. Down here, of course, in, almost into Ethiopia and uh, bordering the entire Mediterranean. A huge empire. The biggest of the four world empires which, of course, make up Nebuchadnezzar's image. Now, let's just take a quick overview of this first seal, verses 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 6. This bowman riding a white horse is a vision depicting a time of peace for the Roman Empire, represented by the white horse, during the reigns of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, the two Antonines and the first three years of Commodus. The spirit of heaven, the rider of the white horse, working through spirit agencies, the Christian community in this case, aimed for victory over the paganism of the Roman Empire. This was to be accomplished by rapid growth of Christianity through evangelism, the bow without an arrow, despite continuing persecution. It was finally accomplished, of course, when Constantine established pseudo-Christianity as the state religion in AD 312. So that's a brief summary. Now you've got that summary in the notes that we've given you. Now I would suggest to you that if you do nothing else, that that summary written alongside of uh, these two verses or somewhere up at the top of the page of your Bible would be a good idea. Because then just in one paragraph you can get a good idea of what this little section on the first seal is about. Now let's have a look at the history of this period in terms of the rulers of the Roman Empire. We've seen the territory over which they ruled. Now let's have a look at the rulers themselves. It was in 1896 that Domitian was assassinated and he was replaced by a man called Nerva. Nothing to do with Nerva's condition. Nerva was a reasonably common Roman name. Now this man Nerva uh, was a reasonably good ruler. He only lasted a couple of years. But he was the first of what is called in history the five good emperors. Now you'll notice I've put the word good uh, in uh, italics, not italics, uh, in commas, inverted commas. And the reason for that is because they were not good from the perspective of Christadelphians. They were good from the perspective of the world. Historians, they drool about this period of, of human <coughs> history. If you read Gibbon, it's a very effusive language about this period, which lasted from AD 96 right through to AD 182, or thereabouts. Now, that's, that's a long time, nearly uh, 100 odd years. So, it was a huge period of peace for the Roman Empire begun by this man Nerva. And they, they talk about it as being an age of prosperity, of peace. Of course there were wars going on on the fringes of the empire. There were, there were Scots and uh, other bands to the north who troubled the empire a little bit, but they were just pinpricks really. Within the bounds of the Roman Empire there was to virtually total peace and harmony and men got on with their lives. The only problem was that the Ecclesia was persecuted viciously. That was the only problem. As we shall see in a moment. It was a problem to some as well. So these five good 
emperors, so-called, might have given prosperity and peace to vast millions of people within the empire, but there was a small class of people who suffered dreadfully at their hands. And that was part of the process, actually, of the, of the bowman sitting on the horse. The, the second of these so-called five good emperors was a man called Trajan, and he was a very uh, capable warrior and proved to be a very capable emperor as far as an administrator is concerned. He ruled for 19 years, from 98 to 117, and was followed by Hadrian, the man who built Hadrian's Wall, obviously. And he was around at the time of the last Jewish rebellion against Roman rule, which was led by a man called Bar Kokhba, uh, who was uh, put down uh, in AD 135 and finally Jerusalem was almost totally destroyed and ploughed as a field and sown with salt and all that sort of thing. Hadrian was the ruler at the time. Then came the first of the two Antonines, as they call them. Now, the first was known as Titus Antoninus. He was also known as Antoninus Pius. He wasn't pious at all. It was P-I-U-S, <coughs> not the way you spell pious, the way the Pope thinks he is. Now this man was also a very capable ruler. He ruled for 23 years and was followed by Marcus Aurelius, another of the Antonines. Now this man also was not only a very good warrior, but he was also a very good ruler of the empire. This is why the empire had peace. They had tight control. And there was no challenges, basically, for the throne. It was to change. It was to change in the rule of Commodus. And we'll talk more about Commodus in a moment. Not a very nice chap at all. But let's just see what was happening while this period of peace, from the, from the beginning of the reign of Nerva, after the, the persecution of Domitian, from here through to the time of Commodus, a time of great prosperity for the empire, but a time of trouble for the ecclesia. Here is a letter to the emperor Trajan by one of his governors. This is what he says. I am wearied with punishing and destroying the Galileans or those of the sect called Christians, according to your orders. Yet they never cease to profess voluntarily what they are, or, and to offer themselves to death. Wherefore I have laboured by exhortation and threatening to discourage them from daring to confess to me that they are of that sect. Yet in defiance of all persecution they still continue to do it. Be pleased therefore to inform me what your highness thinks proper to be done with them. Now when you start reading behind the lines there, what that's telling us is that in this period of history when the persecution had been ordered by Trajan and his successors there was so much blood flowing, Christian blood flowing that they tired of it. The governors tired of it and they tried to talk people out of confessing that they were Christians. Now one of the problems of this period of time was that as we know from the letters in the Apocalypse, apostasy was already creeping into the Brotherhood and there were people who were wonky in their views and they were actually virtually offering themselves for martyrdom. They saw that as like the Arabs do, like the, the people who, who blow themselves up today to kill a few people, thinking that that martyrdom will take them off to paradise. It was a little bit like that in these times. And the, and the brotherhood consisted of those who held to the truth, who were in the increasing minority, and those, of course, who had departed from the truth, who were astray as to their relationship uh, to the state. And they thought that they should rush out and offer themselves... Uh, for, uh, for persecution and for martyrdom. Now, the effect of that, of course, was to bring great pressure on those who confessed Christ. 
And one of the things that happens, this happened in the Acts of the Apostles, when you bring persecution upon believers, is that those who take the right attitude towards it flee. They try and get away from it. They go somewhere else. And when they went somewhere else, they carried the truth with them. And they taught it to people, privately, probably, just like we've got to do in China. They taught the truth and it spread around. And so, of course, slowly but surely, and it took a hundred years or so, Christianity began to grow. It wasn't all pure Christianity, but it began to grow. And it began to take over the Roman world. And that, of course, is what this first seal is about. It's about the ultimate triumph of Christianity in the Roman world. Then let's now look in more detail at Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. The first verse is not uh, going to uh, take us very long. We've already made mention of the thunder. Now this thunder here, we believe, is a reference to political trouble. That's its use in the scripture. You can have a look. We won't, uh, we won't actually go to the first of Samuel 2 verse 10 or chapter 12 verses 16 to 19. But in those two places, thunder occurs at a time of decision and trouble in Israel. And it's also there as part of a divine judgment. There was a time of harvest, for instance, in the first of Samuel chapter 12, when there was thunder out of season and it caused great heartache for Israel because Yahweh was telling them that he wasn't happy with their attitude towards him. So thunder has to do with political trouble. And as we said, in AD 96, the Emperor Domitian, the, the great persecutor of the Ecclesia, was assassinated in a revolt against his corrupt and vicious rule. And that brought great change to the empire. So when we read here that John heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and one of the four living creatures that we talked about in earlier sessions in chapter 4, chapter 5, one of those living creatures said to him, come and see. Now I always think that's fascinating because the living creatures represent the saints in their kingly and administrative role in the kingdom age. It's almost like God is sending someone from the kingdom back to John. Now, of course it's ludicrous in the literal but this is the way the divine mind thinks. God says, well look, here is a vision of people in the kingdom. I'm going to send them from the kingdom to you. It's almost as though uh, that picture over on the wall over there, now when we look at that picture, we don't just see a building and trees, do we? We actually see people in the building. We can't actually see them literally, but we know that they're there. We know that the place is full of people. It would be like some people suddenly emerging out of that picture. Now it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But that's the way God does it. He sends to John one of the living creatures. He's saying, John, that's where you're going. These creatures represent you in the kingdom. Now I'm going to show you what's going to happen between your time and the establishment of that kingdom. I'm going to unfold to you this long history that will be required for you to get there and all those that come after you, for them to get there. They will need to go through these things. And of course the faithful down through the ages have been able to determine with some degree of success where they stood in the scheme of things, where they were up to in the fulfilment of the Bible prophecy that was before them in the apocalypse. Just like we can. We can look back on that history. We know exactly where we are. And of course, whether or not we do something about that, whether it has the impact upon us which it ought to, is a matter for us. But it's, it's as though God has sent someone to us and said, have a look at this. So we should. Now, when you mention history to some people, their eyes roll. Now, you don't have to know a lot about a lot of history to appreciate the Bible. The only history I really know, well, that's not probably true, the only history I'm really interested in, in an eternal sense, is biblical history. I have an interest in history.
full stop. But there are some people who find it difficult. Well, it is difficult when you start out, but if you persist with it, you will grow. And what will happen is, it's a little bit like when you're a child and your mother puts in front of you Brussels sprouts or pumpkin or beans or something else that you don't like eating when you're a child. You had that experience? We used to have a daughter that would hold the bean or the beans or the whatever they were in her mouth. And she'd eventually leave the table. When I leave the table too. <laughs> and they would go down the toilet. Today she understands the value of eating your vegetables. And in fact, you can acquire a taste for them. Things that you hated as a child. If you work at it, you can acquire a taste for it. Same with history. So don't be put off by the fact that there's a fair bit of history to come. Work at it, grow with it, and eventually you might end up being like one or two of us. You'll love it. Sit on a train and read history books every day because you know the importance of it. So then, there was thunder. He had one of the four living creatures come and, and, and say to him, come and see. And in verse 2 he says, I saw and behold a white horse now, white symbolises, as you can see here, righteousness and peace. We said the horse is a common symbol for the Roman Empire because the horse was dedicated to the pagan god Mars. And, of course, the Romans had a penelope of gods and they worshipped different gods for different reasons. And one of the gods they worshipped was Mars and his symbol was a horse. And so they dedicated the horse to him. But thus, we believe that this section of scripture is about that period of peace for the empire between 1896 and 182. White, of course, also symbols righteousness. It symbolises righteousness. There wasn't too much righteousness uh, in the Roman Empire in terms of, of those who knew nothing about the truth. Uh, but what was happening was righteous in the sense that the overthrow of paganism was a righteous thing and God was working at that and ultimately achieved it. Then we come to the phrase, and he that sat on him. So there was a rider on the horse. Now this rider does not refer to an individual but to a series of agents used by the spirit. This period of peace for the empire saw the rapid growth of Christianity even while it was persecuted by successive so-called good emperors. So what we have here in the rider is not just one man but a class of agents that God uses. In this particular case, the agency is the Christian community. They are the ones, as it were, on the horse because they begin to dominate the empire. They began to infiltrate it. Even in Paul's day, it was said by a Roman that they had overturned the world. That was in AD 60-something. Overturned the world. Well, a hundred years later, they were well and truly on the way to overturning paganism within the empire. Then it says he had a bow. No arrow, just a bow. Now, the bow symbolises in Scripture speech or teaching. Let's have a quick look at Job 29. We've had a look at this before in relation to another subject. In Job 29, we read in verse 20, My glory, says Job, was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. He's not talking about a literal bow. He says in verse 21, Unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. After my words they spake not again and my speech dropped upon them. So when Job talks about a bow being renewed in his hand, he's talking about his speech, his teaching, 
which men would listen to and were influenced by. So the bow is used in that way. In uh, Zechariah chapter 9 verses 13 and 14, the bow is also used of Judah as the motivation for the arrow Israel in the work of Elijah when he brings back the Jews from their dispersion after Armageddon. So then, it is also used in that context of a multitude of people. So when you put those two things together, the bow represents speech or teaching and it's also identified with a multitude. And that's exactly what it represents here. For there was a time in the Roman Empire when Christianity spread to all parts of that empire by preaching, by speech. People would pass on. The knowledge of Christianity wasn't always, towards the end anyway, wasn't always pure Christianity, but it was Christianity in contrast to paganism. And it began to infect the whole of the empire. And that was done by a multitude of people. And we read here of this bow in the hand of the rider that sat on the white horse. We are reading about the influence of the spread of Christianity throughout the empire. And ultimately it was to lead to victory because it says, and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now that crown, as you can see, is the Stephanos. It was the crown of victory, not of rulership or government. Kings wore crowns made of gold or some other combination of metals. And that sat upon their head wouldn't have been terribly comfortable. But those who ran in a race, who were a victor in the games, were given a Stephanos, which was normally made out of a wreath of leaves. And that was placed over the head. It was, of course, a non-enduring reward faded away. But this crown here represents the final victory of Christianity in the empire. It became ultimately the dominant religion. And finally, when Constantine came to power in AD 312, he made it the state religion. So, of course, the work of the white horse and its rider, with a bow but no arrow, had been brought to its culmination. Now that's basically, and I don't want to go into any more complexity than that, that's basically what verses 1 and 2, the opening of the first seal, is all about. I don't think that's too hard, is it? Just a few notes in your margin will allow you to recover that in the future. Let's then move on to verses 3 and 4. We come to the second seal. Now the second seal provides the imagery of a red horse and the rider of this red horse takes peace from the earth that's the story verse 3 when he had opened the second seal I heard the second living creature say come and see now some of the better texts leave out the final words and see the record apparently just says come and there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword now what's this all about well firstly a quick summary the second seal we believe goes from AD 183 to 211 so it's a shorter period of time but a vicious period of time in Roman history the vision depicts the period of Commodus from the third year of his reign 183 to 192 he was strangled to death Pertinax 193 who being virtuous, virtuous was assassinated by the Praetorian Guard Didius Julianus who gained power by paying two, uh, by, by paying uh, 25,000 sesterces or 250 pounds to each of the 15,000 Praetorian Guard. He was beheaded by them 63 days later. That was the worst investment ever made. <laughs> Septimus Severus, 
193 to 211, whose firm rule brought some relief to the empire which had been turned red by the Praetorian Guard. Now we'll talk more about the Praetorian Guard in a moment, but they were a very powerful group of people who had the power to do as they pleased and to put on the throne who they pleased in this particular period of Roman history. You know, it's amazing how men can create a, a monster that can come back one day and devour them. And the Praetorian Guard was one such monster of the times. Put there originally to protect the emperor from assassination, they ended up being the assassins themselves. A bit more detail then about this second seal period. Commodus. He reigned 12 years. The first three years of his reign were reasonably peaceful and satisfactory after the tenor of the five emperors that had preceded him in the previous hundred years or so. Now, it changed. It changed because there was a plot against him apparently led by his sister. It's a bit hard, isn't it, when your sister actually decides that you're not worthy of ruling the empire. And he wasn't. He was an idiot. He came, to the, he came to the throne at the age of 19 and he went crazy. A little bit like Nero, who came to the throne at the age of 17, lasted 14 years, and in that 14 years did incredible damage, including killing the Apostle Paul in the last month of his life. A bit like that. Now this Commodus ended up being one of the worst of the emperors of the Roman Empire. He was profligate, which means that nothing stood in his way. What he wanted to do, he did. If uh, he wanted something, he took it. Laws meant nothing to him. Principles, absolutely nothing. And so once his, his deep corruption was revealed after this plot against his life blood flowed freely in the Roman Empire. It is said that in this time 2,000 people on average died every day. He had people agents out there putting others to death. In fact he discovered that the Senate was against him so he got rid of most of the senators that was the elected basically the elected people that ruled Rome. Many of them were so-called virtuous people. That is, they lived by some rules. He got rid of them. It started a period of unbelievable rapacity within the Roman Empire. But finally, they caught up with him and someone strangled him. Probably too kind a death for that man. He was followed by a man called Pertinax. Now, of course, there was a reaction. The extreme folly of Commodus caused so much heartache for the Roman Empire after the five good emperors that they went the other way. They said, look, we've got to find a virtuous man. So they found a man called Pertinax. And he was, by uh, human standards, virtuous just and upright and true in his dealings. An honest man. He didn't last long. He lasted 12 months. And the Praetorian Guard decided that it was time for him to go because they were not honest and they weren't getting their way. Their corruptions were revealed for what they were and Pertinax stood in the way of these men and they assassinated him in AD 193. He was followed by the choice of the Praetorian Guard themselves. They basically auctioned the emperorship, saying, well, who's going to pay the most? And along comes this man, a millionaire, a billionaire probably in his time, a Bill Gates of the time, and he says, I'd love to be emperor. So they bargained 25,000 sesterces for each of the 15,000 of the Praetorian Guard, he forked out a huge sum of money. 63 days later, they cut his head off. Not just his head, 
but everybody associated with him. And so it went on. Finally, there arrived a man after a battle with two other contenders for the throne called Septimus Severus, who ruled from 193 to 211 and restored at least some degree of stability and order to the empire. He got control to some degree of the Praetorian Guard and stopped some of the bloodshed. But because of the problems and the lack of rulership and leadership, the empire slipped into the scourge of famine, which of course is the subject matter of the following seals. And we'll leave that to Brother Peter. So there we have a summary of the emperors involved in this period. Now let's just have a look at the detail of verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 doesn't require much comment. Verse 4. There went out another horse that was red. Now this red horse, red of course, we know represents sin and bloodshed. In Isaiah 1 verse 18 it represents sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, says that verse. And red also represents, being the colour of blood, bloodshed. So here we have the prevalence of corruption or sin leading to the shedding of much blood. That's of course how it was in the beginning, wasn't it? The first murder was of a righteous man by an unrighteous man. Cain slew his brother Abel. Sin, says James chapter 1 verse 14, brought forth death. So there it is, red. Sin brought forth death. So corruption entered the government, the result was bloodshed. And that's of course an equation which we see across human experience and you can see it even in any community of people, those who may even claim to be religious. But when they go to fight of warfare amongst themselves, if there is corruption involved, then things happen which are a direct consequence of that corruption being at work. People suffer. There is, as it were, to use the common phrase, blood on the floor. Sin brought forth death. Here it was, red. And assassination and murder in high places became the order of the day until there was a total breakdown of authority in the empire. But then we come to the phrase, and power was given to him that sat thereon. The writer here represents a class of agents blindly executing retribution on the lambs, that is, Christ's enemies. The period was dominated by the Praetorian Guard who tyrannised the city of Rome and its rulers. They dominated that place. Now, they'd been placed there as a guard, a bodyguard, basically, for the emperors. Ended up being kingmakers, we shall see in a moment. And then we have, towards the end of verse 4, reference to the weapon of assassination. It says, Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, the Roman earth, that they should kill one another. And they did that very effectively. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now this word sword here is the Greek word machaira and it denotes a short sword or a dagger. Now the normal weapon of the Roman soldier was a machaira. But in, in, in this particular case it's obvious what it represents in this context. is the weapon of the Roman soldier but for the purpose of use for assassination and murder. So when they sent men to get rid of people, whether they were emperors or senators or supporters or family of those that they wanted to get rid of, they would come in quietly in the night usually and with their machaira, about that long, 
right, drawn, and they would use it to stab people to death. No noises made, just a few gurgles, gone. That's the, the, the assassin's weapon. Isn't it amazing? Nothing ever changes. In this sophisticated world, there is hardly a day that goes by where someone is not stabbed with a machaira. In a domestic dispute, some situation where someone hates someone else, they're stabbed with a short knife or dagger. Still used today for the same purpose it was used by the Praetorian Guard. So, this passage is about the flow of blood caused by the failure of one man. His name was Commodus. Born in AD 161, the son of Marcus Aurelius, and that's why he got the throne. Marcus Aurelius was his father and predecessor. So Marcus Aurelius groomed his son for the throne. He became emperor at the age of 19 in AD 180. Now, look, I don't care who you are. Unless you're the Lord Jesus Christ, at age 19, you cannot rule a kingdom the size of the Roman Empire. You couldn't even rule your own house at that age, probably. Some may do better than others. 19 is not an age to be putting people into positions of responsibility for which they are not cut out, and he wasn't cut out for the job. As soon as he came to power, he looked around for opportunities to use his wealth and power for his own purposes. He gathered around him a clique of people who would say, yes, sir, no, sir, to everything he said. Yes, men. And they did his bidding. He proceeded to try and make himself into a god. He claimed, as you can see there, towards the bottom of that uh, transparency, he, he demanded to be worshipped as the god Hercules. Now, if anybody knows anything about Hercules, you'll know he's the god with muscles. Right? He's the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the Roman um, calendar, as it were. So, Hercules was the one with the brimming muscles, you know, the biceps and the triceps. He had all the power and the strength. Well, they call people Hercules if they're strong. So he wanted to be worshipped. You actually had to take a pinch of, of um, incense, put it on the altar when you're in the presence of this man, to worship him as Hercules. Well, of course, not too many people enjoyed that. But it got worse. As we said earlier, the plot against him in 183 roused the dormant ferocity of his character and he plunged into an orgy of cruelty, murder and licentiousness. He used to go in to the, uh, into the uh, Colosseum and he would uh, be a gladiator. And of course he was always victorious. Nobody was game enough to kill the emperor. So he did pretty well. He's probably useless, but nobody tried, to, tried very hard to, to beat him. And it came the time when someone got him in the quietness of the night and got their hands around his throat and choked the life out of this man. But he'd lasted 12 years before that happened. And he set in motion a string of events. He gave an idea to the Praetorian Guard and they were quick to use it. But if you use violence and power and bloodshed, you can keep people in thraldom, lock them up and manipulate them. And that's exactly what they did. And the Praetorian Guard emerged at this time as a very powerful force. Initially, as we said, they were the elite of the Roman legions, some 15,000 strong, <laughs> stationed around Rome to ensure the security of the emperor and the senate. That was their job. Now, you can imagine that being in a time of peace, as had been for decades, 
but they were like a lot of public servants, haven't got much to do. So what do you do if you haven't got much to do? Well, before they put the clampers on it, a lot of public servants used to get on the internet and look up all sorts of images on the internet. And a few of them got sacked, so most of them don't do that anymore. So what do they do? They go to the coffee shops and they're out there for an hour. And you ask them, well, well, have you been out there for an hour? Well, I've got nothing to do. And you've seen this before, haven't you? Now, a lot of you are probably saying, I'd love to have a job like that. No, just keep what you got. You're better off. Because when people haven't got enough to do, they find something to do. It's like Uncle Peter used to say, you know, the idleness, it's the devil's workshop. Isn't that the saying? Yeah, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. It's true. And these men stood around saying, there's 15,000 of us, what are we going to do? And this fellow Commodus put ideas in their mind. He fed them. And eventually they got rid of him and they then proceeded to rule the empire. They put emperors on the throne and they took them off. And Rome flowed with blood. These men who regarded themselves as kingmakers held the throne to ransom for their own greed and power. So came to an end, for a time, the tragedy of the second seal. Its consequences were to flow off, of course, into the dreadful famines that were to flow uh, from the loss of stability in the empire, about which Brother Peter will talk next time around. I've